Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Alwyn Paul is an educationalist and his hot takes on what is going on in New Zealand education are pure gold. He's a perfect person to talk to in order to understand how the collapse of our education system has happened and what we can do to fix it. Let's talk with Alwyn now and find out his views on the latest revelations of the failure of our education system. Alwyn Paul, welcome back to The Crunch. Good to have you back. Uh, Thank you, Cam. My pleasure. You know, whenever there's things going on in education, the person I immediately think about talking to is Alwyn Paul. And uh, you've got a bit of a track record in education. You've set up charter schools, operated charter schools, and you are a vocal person on the topic of education. So we've got a few issues in our system now, don't we? Yeah, we do. It doesn't necessarily sit comfortable that I'm the charter school guy. I I, I was interested. I met um, Andrew Little, uh, and I'd never met him before, and I happened to bump into him in Russell, and I said hello. And I said, okay, my name's uh, Alan. He goes, oh, you're the education guy. And I went, huh, that's a little better than being the charter school guy. So, I mean, I I did teach for eight years in state schools. I did teach at St. Cuthbert's College, uh, established a private school and and was principal at the private school for 18 years and established a charter school. But I I guess, I think uh, it was Michael Laws who called me an education train spotter. (laughs) And and it has been really influential on my thinking in the last five or six years to dig deep into the data for New Zealand education and particularly high school education. And we, not that I stopped doing it, but uh, an initial dig into that probably sort of 20, 25 years ago it led to, to three conclusions. Uh, one was that we were actually pretty good in terms of our year one to six. You know, it, it wasn't too bad. Uh, that if you had a child uh, get through to year 10 or, or the old form four in good shape, then they were probably going to do okay almost, almost no matter what high school they went to. But that we really did lose the plot for our intermediate and first two years of high school, for which, of course, you know, there was no data, nothing you could do. But it has changed. And, you know, we've now got a huge disparity between the schools that are producing good results and and those that are just producing appalling results. Um, and I actually think uh, it, it begins with parenting our zero to fives. I, I, that's a big deal. Um, the government, I don't think, has a handle on that yet. You talk about the data, and Christopher Luxon and Erica Stanford stood up at the National Party Conference on the weekend uh, that's just gone and talked about an abysmal record in mathematics at year eight. So that's just before you go to secondary school, right? Year eight. Yep. In, old, in old school terms, form one and form two. Form one is year seven, year eight is form two. Correct. And those numbers that they announced were appalling. Of course, Labor has uh, argued against those numbers. Mm. And that they've got a better number, but it's only slightly better. Uh, but the end result is the majority of students in year eight, and there's no other word for this. As I know it's a forbidden word. It's the F word. Uh, failing. Only 22% of students at year eight are at the expected standard for maths. Now, Labor says that, no, no, that's wrong. It's 42%. But either way, the majority of students aren't at the standard. In other words, they're failing. And three out of five of those students, or 60%, are more than a year behind. And it gets even worse if you're in the lowest decile schools, I know we're not allowed to talk about those anymore because if you just remove the mention of the word decile, everybody's equal. But 8% of kids are at the curriculum level in in year eight in those decile schools and nearly 80% a year behind in Maori are in a similar boat. 
what what is it telling us about like you were saying you know you looked over six years and it looked like we were pretty good up until we got to intermediate school and then the wheels fall off is this the wheels falling off or have they long gone and we've got a real disaster on our hands that could affect a generation of school children uh well chris hipkins came out i i, I he, he, that's a, that's a forbidden term isn't it he didn't he didn't come out sorry i mean i'm not i'm not telling people anything uh, unusual about Chris, uh, but he said in the last couple of days, well, we can blame all this on national and we can blame all this on national standards. Well, first of all, parents really liked national standards. They were by no means uh, perfect. They uh, had far too much um, pushed into them by the teacher unions to have what they called overall teacher judgment and so you can have a kid say do a standardized test not get a very good result but a teacher thought they were trying hard and so they would you know say that they were uh, at standard but this has very little to do with uh, national standards and one thing the national standards did show is that the longer kids were in our schools the further behind standard they got. And there was a real drop-off at year seven and eight. Um, And, of course, we can't tell what happened in nine and ten because we didn't have anything, and and we pretty much still don't have anything. Uh, So it could have been worse at year nine and ten. We just just don't know. And so we're kind of picking the end of year eight as a a little bit of, of a random number, uh, whereas you know, we should have the continuity, which I think is one of the things that National is looking at with these standardised tests. But I, I think it's a bigger issue. And first of all, uh, and, I, and I've said it before on your show, I, I think we desperately need a non-ideological crown entity for parenting, particularly for during pregnancy, mm. uh, because we've got a really big problem with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome and, yep. and other things going wrong before birth uh, that are that are highly preventable, much easier to prevent them than, than to come up with solutions later in life. Um, and for our zero to fives, because that's where so much of, of the brain is doing its learning development. It's a critical phase. Uh, people might say particularly between zero and three, but I, you know I think you can extend that. Where all of the foundations for language and math is a language, uh, and, and the words in mathematics are as important as the symbols. Mm. Um, all of those language and numeracy foundations are laid during that time period, and so you're getting uh, and you mentioned the lower decile and. Uh, it's that's that's statistically proven. Kids in poorer homes, by and large, uh, hear thousands less words every day, and that that's a big deal. So first of all, we have to deal with the zero to fives, and I guess schools, sorry, governments often think, well, schools we can do it, and you know we're more important than parents. They're not. Schools aren't more important than parenting. Uh, schools are there to support parenting. But then, uh, you know, you get into our school system. Uh, One of the things that the teacher council has just said that is that uh, teachers, new new teachers or teachers entering the profession have to have level two mathematics. That's actually a really good start. I've only been saying that for about six years. I'm astonished Uh, it's not the case now. Well, it's not the case now. In fact, you have to have, you have very little. And I think it was, well, one of the research uh, people last year uh, did uh, something where it showed that so many, uh, such a high proportion of our teachers feel inadequate in mathematics and in their ability to teach it. And so it's a one thing to say, oh, those coming into the profession, but there's going to be a huge lag there. So why not say to the people who are in the profession that over the next three years... Get up to speed. ...or support you to get a level one science, uh, level two English if you haven't got it, and level two math. And I, I that will make an incredible difference. New curriculum's nice uh, if it's good. Um, new methodologies can improve things, although often they freak people out and they put up barriers to applying them. 
But if you're standing in front of a class trying to teach them something that you don't know yourself, uh, neither you nor the child's got a chance. These numbers around mathematics, is this like the easiest thing to gauge? Because, you know, in maths, there's no in between. You're either right or you're wrong. There's no, you know, show us your work. Oh, you've turned quite well there, but you've missed the boat. Um, but we're still going to give you a good mark because you tried. It kind of doesn't work like that in maths. Trying on an equation or or whatever mathematical problem exists in trigonometry or geometry or anything else, it requires a right answer, and anything else other than the right answer is a wrong answer. So isn't it easier to assess where we're at with competency in maths, because you either know it or you don't know it. And if you don't know it, well, that's simple. Whereas if it was history or maths, you've got into um, history or English, um, you know, um, home economics, you've got interpretations of what is right. You know, you've got, if you've, if you've got sound reasoning in a history uh, essay, for example, you can still score good points because you've backed it up with some evidence and, and some things, and you're just looking at it slightly differently from somebody else. So it's more subjective. But maths is not subjective, is it? It's well, yeah. And the higher you get, the the less subjective it is. So mm. my oldest did uh, an engineering engineering degree in the US. Well, his calculus exams and and a lot of his other exams uh were, for instance, they might have three questions, and by three questions, they're not yes answers. Uh, you know, they're 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 an hour's worth of work. Yeah. And you got 33%, 67% or 100%. And it, based on the answer that you got. Now, clearly, you have to be really good at the working. So there is a formative time mm. when you can encourage kids to, you know, to work through a problem and they can see that they're almost there. So you're identifying where they make the mistakes. And so you, you can receive encouragement and, and, and some credit for that. Um, but yes, ultimately, you want to get the correct number. So it is, in that sense, easier to measure. Um, but there's huge method behind it. Um, so, I mean, I've always taught kids that they ought to be getting 100% in any situation that they are doing math. Now, it might be early on, like when they're learning a new concept, that 100% might require a lot of help. So, you know, you go to your teacher, you work something out, you sit next to a neighbour who's doing it well, and you keep learning until you get it. But you don't give up. Uh, and I often talk to them about, look, math is like uh, you're a mechanic and someone brings a Ferrari into the garage. You make sure that you do a great job. You get all of the help you need. Uh, you clean the car. It looks good. All that sort of stuff. And that's that's the approach that you need to bring. The second approach that you need to bring to math uh, is I just have four or five saying with kids that I would repeat ad nauseum. And first of all, math is doable. Uh, you know, a lot of adults have got this huge barrier to math and you've got those great sayings like, oh, it's different than when I did it. Uh, or when are you going to use that in the real world and, and all of this sort of stuff, which it's the last thing that kids want to hear. Um, or he ha he doesn't have a math brain, or she doesn't have a math brain. And there's no such thing as a math brain. So I'd say to kids, you know, first of all, math is doable. Second thing, there are only four operations that you need to worry about. So math is like playing tennis. Tennis, you've got forehand, backhand, volley, smash and serve. You yeah. know? That's it. And you've got some variations on that, and you have to be pretty darn good at it. But you've only got addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Just about everything else is a variation on that. And, and you can break that actually down to two. Inverse is math and uh, – sorry, multiplication, division are inverse. Uh, addition and subtraction are inverse. So if you perfect that, it's a good start. Then there are rules, you know, just like in tennis – uh, you've got to keep the ball in the court and things like that. There are rules that you need to follow in math. And the key one is the order that you do things in. And then uh, there is language. And it, as the further you go up, there are there are more words or more phrases that can freak you out when you first hear them. So you always say to kids, attack the language. Find out what the word means because they're not using the word to confuse you. 
They're using the word to stop you using a sentence to describe something. So it's it's specific. It's a language. And then the other thing, and I, I think it's a thing that we struggle with in life now, and that is you need to do a crap load of work to become good at maths. Uh, you know, you don't walk into a class and absorb it because uh, the teacher tells you one thing. You need to repeat stuff. You need to ask questions. You need to engage in it. So from all of those perspectives, it's not just that um, a lot of our kids aren't very good at math. It, it means that they're not very good at learning. They, they aren't being taught how to go about things to become good. Well, that's where I was going to get to because my experience of maths at school was decidedly average. Mm-hmm. I think I only passed about three or four exams in maths, and from the fifth form onwards, it was a downward slide. Yep. Yet I was scoring, you know, ninety in the nineties in English and history, and you know, other subjects like that. And and I actually put it down to the teachers that I had. At the time, hmm. I had English teachers that excited me about English. I had history teachers that excited me about history, so much so that, you know, everything I do, I always look at a historical or historiosity to look yep. at politics or religion or anything like that. It gives you a good basis. But I had nobody who excited me about maths. In fact, I had the exact opposite of that. I had a world renowned maths teacher is very famous name. And if I asked you as an educationalist who the top maths teacher is in New Zealand, you'd probably say his name. Well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Um, you know, he, he was a, a sports person, a famous sports person in uh, weightlifting, and then uh, went on to be a teacher in mathematics. Uh-huh. Quite well known. Uh, ended up at McLean's College. But before that, he was at my school when I was a kid. And he was hardly ever in the class. Right. And when he was in the class, he sat up the front and told us which pages of the textbook we were to work through and which page um, of the quiz at the end of the chapter we had to do for homework. Mm-hmm. And that was this world-class teacher teaching maths at one of the top schools in New Zealand. Yeah. I mean, my experience with math at school was was similar. But I – so – I'd actually dropped it by year 13, by the second form. And in my ignorance, and I'm thankful for that ignorance now, there were two reasons why I chose to do an economics degree, an economics major. One was I thought it would be descriptive and there wouldn't be much math in it. (laughs) And the second one was uh, I, I was terrified of public speaking. So anything that didn't have a seminar, was, was a big plus in my book as I went through the university calendars. So I kind of flew through the first year of a business degree and um, opened my textbooks for my major, and it was all differential calculus. Mm. Um, it was I was terrified, and I thought, okay, well, what are you going to do? And at, uh, it was Massey, actually, Palmerston North, when it was in pretty good shape. And and so I did a course called Methods of Mathematics, and I went right back to the beginning. And it was probably the best academic thing that happened to me because I I had to go back to to absolute first principles in math and and also learn how to learn it. Mm. And, you know, it took a heck of a lot of effort, but ultimately my economic statistics uh, paper. Uh, I, I think I was the only A plus in the course. My advanced economic theory was it was a pretty solid A, uh, and things like that. Um, so it wasn't it was an ability. Again, it was it was I think the way I'd been taught. And you know, sometimes when we're at school as a young person, we're not the best students in the world, um, and, and we don't take it upon ourselves to learn. But that's what being a young person is. You need someone to lead you into that situation. And I love teaching kids math. I love teaching them the basics of science. I actually quite enjoy teaching them economics. But with math, you've got that background to it that when they start to succeed, they are delighted because they're doing something well that they've probably heard so many times Mm. they won't be able to do. And, And they can fly into it. Um, and we have we have problems right through the levels. One of the issues with the NCEA is that you look at you break the course into achievement standards, and the kid goes, "Well, I don't know statistics, so 
I, I can still get through, I can still get my my sort of 12 to 14, 15, 16 credits by ignoring statistics and doing the other ones. Mm. Well, you know, you're starting to shrink down the size of the course that they're actually being exposed to, because if they know they're not going to do it. Um, plus, when you get to universities, a lot of exam sitting and a, a truckload of our kids are leaving school without really having sat an external exam. Um, because they don't need to, they've already got the credits. So, so as I say, this is not uh, a year seven and eight issue. This is a parenting issue. It's a foundational issue in our schools, um, partially because a lot of our teachers, by their own admission, you know, I'm not picking on them, uh, by their own admission, are, are not good at the subject, uh, afraid to teach it. Plus, we we don't really measure uh, until it's too late. Uh, and, and then we've got these other issues further up. It's a great subject as well. I mean, you know, you just, you school kids up for a lot of things in life mm. if ultimately they can do reasonably well at the subject. See, the, the thing is my recollection of schooling is all of bad teachers and the very good <laughs> teachers. I, I, I really <laughs> could count on the fingers of one finger. Uh, yeah. But I'm looking at these results and I'm sitting there thinking this is pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Now, putting aside the parenting issue, because that's a whole other order of magnitude of difficulty to solve. So but it has to be solved. It has to be solved, right? Yeah. But uh, in terms of putting a finger on something uh, to to address this, parenting has a role, absolutely, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And 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 we have a societal deficit when it comes to parenting. Yep. Let's put that aside and let's talk about the education system. We always have been told, you know, by various different people that we have a world-class education system, that we are better than everybody else, that we have better ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Yet here's a piece of empirical evidence that suggests that that's not the case. And if that's true, and let's accept that it is true, and we, and we can argue about the number, whether it's 22% or 42% or somewhere in between, mm -hmm. right? That's an indictment on the system and those who are in the system that they've, this didn't happen overnight. No. So the very people who have been gaslighting us about whether we've got a world-class system are the ones that are in that system. And you actually have to hold, it's maths, right? It's right or wrong. We mm -hmm. were 22% or 42% passing. Everybody else is failing. Occam's razor says the system's the problem and the people in the system. Yep. And then we then when you start picking into that, you've got a highly unionized workforce. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, about essentially three teacher unions uh, and you know, for senior teachers in secondary school teachers and obviously the you know, junior school and early education teachers, there's three different unions, and no one's prepared to say, you know what, guys, see that number, that 22%? That shows that you're failing, that your systems are failing. And when you fail, you, you don't just get an F, right? And there, there has to be consequences for that. Yeah. And part of that consequences is should be, we're not going to listen to you anymore because we've listened to you for the last 30 years since tomorrow's schools came in you know, under David Longy and that was going to solve everything. And here we are 30 years later with worse statistics than when they started. Something's wrong. And yep. you're the only common denominator. And we're going to talk maths again. You're the common denominator in all of this. Yeah. And if somebody does that, the parents of this country are going to go, hallelujah. Yeah. But I'm not sure that Erica Stanford or Chris Luxon have got the stones or the courage to confront the teachers' union about what is obviously a failure. Well, well they have made a start. And, and I think uh, the other day is the first time that Erica Stanford, uh, you know, brought the union uh, failure into the discussion. Uh, and, and I mean, there are big issues with the teacher unions, and and I, I think they need to solve them. I mean, they are going to have a part in the New Zealand education system moving forward. 
And, and therefore, they need to ask themselves a question. Are they going to have a positive part in improving our system? Or, for example, are they over the next six years just going to bang on about charter schools? Um, and, and one of the, big... the answer right now. <laughs> well, I think I know the answer too. They but I saw... bang on about charter schools, and 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 that raises a really good point now in the yeah. whole discussion. Yeah. The last time we had charter schools, the unions vociferously opposed it. The Labor Party backed them up, and as yep. soon as the government changed and Labor was in charge, that was the end of them. How yep. are we going to ensure that? I mean. It, it, I mean, I've been looking at some of the submissions on the new charter school schools legislation, and you've got uh, rote answers. It's mm. ironic, really, isn't it? Teachers that are, are poor rote learning are teaching their union members to write rote replies to submissions yeah. that all say there's no evidence that charter schools work. But it doesn't take very much effort to to find evidence, such as you know the 2023. National Charter School Study, uh, you know, version three from Credo, which gives you ample evidence that charter schools actually work. Yeah, if you if you go back to the to the union thing, I, I mean, from my experience, I, I think I lasted as a new teacher at Taronga Boys three weeks in the union before, you know, I, I realised that they were basically just a bullying organisation. I, I got a note from someone in Christchurch the other day who had gone to one of the most recent meetings, he said anyone who spoke from the floor about some of the positive possibilities of charter schools were shouted down. Um, so, you know, is that the behaviour you want in a classroom, for instance? So they don't model behaviour very well. It then didn't take long to work out that in most schools, the person who is the union rep is the person who's going to be most likely to be in need of the union uh, because they're often the most appalling of teachers. And, and so, you know, you get, uh, I'm going to say, the rabble rising to the top, and a massive amount of teachers belong to unions just because of the pay negotiations. They don't want all this other nonsense going on. Uh, they'd much rather have a professional association that represented them properly, um, not the situation that we've currently got. And you're right. I mean, their submissions were just appalling. You know, no evidence. Well, I, you know, I can I can give them evidence of schools that I started, schools that Nakai started, schools that Raymond Tipani started, that succeeded within New Zealand. I can give them evidence of schools in New Zealand that are designated character, like uh, St Joseph Māori Girls in Napier, which is in the top twenty schools in New Zealand, despite being a low decile school. Manukura Palmerston North, also in the top twenty in New Zealand despite being a low decile school. So these are schools with variation uh, in them, which are also, you know, pretty much ignored by the unions. Um, you know, plus they'd say just the usual nonsense, uh, you know, we don't want a system where people can make profit. I think anyone who can make profit out of the charter school budgets uh, really should be the new Minister of Finance because uh, the way it's budgeted for through government, it's it's just not possible. Uh, to make any anything substantial, and most, if not all, will set up as charitable trusts or charitable companies, like I have. Mm. You know uh, uh, that we're allowed to charter schools are allowed to employ non qualified teachers. Well, there's two thousand teachers in the state system on limited authorities to teach. That is unqualified teachers teaching in the state system, and, and so I don't know how they sit there and spout this stuff. Um, and, and then go back to teach a classroom and ask the kids for integrity. It's almost like, uh, you know, these are what we, we need to oppose this no matter what. There's, there's no, it's not an educational um, answer. It's an ideological answer. That's right. You know, in, and in the United States, the charter school movement has been exceptionally good at selling charter schools to the public and beating the teacher union. Yeah. The way they do it is different. Right? They start by having the right people doing the selling. Mm -hmm. the parents and the kids who would be at failing public schools without a charter, right? Yeah. Then that means that they also get, you know, people of colour talking about how the public schools don't serve the community well rather than some of the white funders of the charter movement, right? So you're getting mm -hmm. parents who have got kids who are affected by the public schools doing a poor job saying this is what we want. 
And then they make the discussion about education a discussion about civil rights rather than an industrial relations issue. Mm -hmm. And then people start to realise that charter schools can be part of the community. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there is a hugely different, even media tone this time, which is good because people know that we need this. I mean, the unions, one of the other things they kept saying the other day is that we already have choice in the New Zealand system. Well, they are putting themselves in the place of defending the choice that only the wealthy or the Catholics have. And, and so we have in New Zealand, we have got uh, 2,112 state schools. We have 91 private schools. We have 335 integrated schools, 226 of which are Catholic. Now, to go to a Catholic school, there's a significant barrier. To go to a private school, there's a significant financial barrier. Um, and so where's the choice? Uh, and, and, and where especially is the choice for the kids who don't have any money, who can't shift into the grammar zone, uh, who live in a small provincial town and their parents aren't wealthy enough to put them in a boarding school? Or Catholic or Anglican or Presbyterian. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think charter schools were hamstrung last time. And that may be an erroneous view, but I felt that the national-led government wasn't that keen on them, and so they just let, let it, you know, just sort of gave it lip service, and then consequently it was easier for it to be overturned. But everybody, almost it seems to me that the American way of getting parents who have suffered it at public schools to front this is the way to go. I mean, mm -hmm. almost of us have experience of going to school where there were good teachers, very few of them, and bad teachers, a lot of them, and but they were all paid the same. Yep. So there needs to be a case made that the real world means reward for merit and achievement, not for turning up. And if we can do that, that will help us pay better teachers more than the dud teachers. Well, well one of the union people who was submitting actually – uh, had to submit after me the other day, and I said, you know, that we paid our teachers more than state. He was blown away. He had no idea. I mean, he sort of looked at the people in the select committee and said, well, why doesn't everyone know that? Um, and, and of course, and I mean, if I'm employing a first-year teacher and he or she's doing the job of someone who's working at top of the scale, I, I'm going to work very hard to have their income uh, equal, you know, you're not going to pull down the other person unless they're doing an appalling job. But if they're doing an appalling job, I wouldn't employ them anyway. And and yeah, it's 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 a big deal. You were right. You're right. I, I think national uh, the blowback on charter schools, the the orchestrated blowback on charter schools, uh, bothered them because you know they were uh, really conservative in, in their approach to lots of things. And their main aim was was being perpetually in government, not not improving the country. I think that's different this time. Or I hope it's different. And uh, you, I, we, I mean, I'm well aware of a significant amount of the people who are applying to become charter schools. There are some really good applications going in uh, from some strong organisations, and and so it's going to be harder, much harder for Labour, you know, when, eventually when they get back in 30, 40 years' time, to sort of crap all over them again. See, I look back in history, again, I said that earlier, history gives us some good lessons. Yeah. I look back at, at Obama in 2010, mm -hmm. he was president, and he went to war with the teacher unions. Yep. He came out with a policy which he called race to the top reforms. Yep. Uh, and he was accused of, uh, by the teacher unions, uh, of scapegoating teachers when the problems were more systemic. But he identified it quite squarely. He actually said, no, actually, teachers are to blame here and bad teachers should be fired And if they can't train kids to succeed. Uh, it, yep. Listen to the, these words. This is from a Democrat, right? Imagine if we could have these words come out of a Labour Party leader or or even Mr. Luxon. He said, you've got to have radical change. And radical change is something that's in the interest of students. Right. We've got to be able to identify teachers who are doing well. And ultimately, if some teachers aren't doing a good job, 
they've got to go. Yep. Do, you, do you agree with Obama on that? Yeah, I do. Um, it, it, and, and again, it starts at the top. I mean, a lot of schools, will, teachers will say that they're stressed by the amount of uh, busy work that they have to do. A lot of that happens because you've got middle managers or senior managers in schools who who are pushing the busy work onto them uh, because they're kind of justifying a role when they're sitting in an office uh, for nine or 10 hours a day and they've got to think of something to do. So the first thing they think to do is get someone else to do something. Uh, so at least they've, you know, uh, got some research going on that they can then respond to later. Uh, rather than going around the school and, and dropping into classes and, and doing some work with the kids themselves and all that sort of thing. Um, so, and again, I, I mean, I, I don't think Hipkins or Tonetti really did anything of worth um, as ministers of education. Um, they protected the hegemony of the of the um, of the teacher unions is what they did. Oh, very much so. And I, I mean, I, I I still remain astounded that Ardern stood up when they had uh, passed the law to close down the charter school model, and and she said, as we promised to the teacher unions, mm -hmm. or, or, I mean the families, the kids. Um, all of those sorts of things aren't their first priority. Um, do you do you need good teachers in your system? Absolutely. Uh, and if a teacher is there just collecting their paycheck, you know, go and get another job. Go and pick fruit. Uh, it needs to be your passion, uh, and, and because the children depend not entirely, uh, but they depend on you for for an aspect of their future that you're supposed to be helping them with. Uh, and if you're not, go away. What would happen if the Ministry of Education closed its Wellington office, sacked all its bureaucrats? Do you think the students or the parents would notice? Uh, I, I think the Ministry should have a really important role. A and, uh, you know, not not that I, you know, necessarily think I'd, I'd ever lead it, but I think the first thing, uh, the new person coming in when I own a Holstead leaves to do is to send a survey to every principal in the country uh, and say, what do you need from us? How can we help you and your school do a better job? What problems do we create in our current mode? Um, and, and those sort of things, because their job uh, is to serve the schools so the schools can serve the children. Mm. Um, and anything that they're not doing uh, in, that, in that realm, they shouldn't be doing at all. Um, and same in a school. If, every, if, if there's anything you're doing that's not actually for the benefit of the kids, don't do it because you exist for the children. That's, that's what a school is. Um, and that's not to say you don't have staff socials, you don't... Uh, you know, reward, reward to, all of that stuff is about building that that sense of purpose and and reward for people who are doing things well. But the ultimate aim of that is to improve what they do for children. Mm. Um, and and so it's you've got to be really singularly focused. Um, and it's a big deal. Well, you know, hopefully the government is grasping the nettle to you know to coin a a phrase that's often overused. Um, most people actually have never grasped a lead nettle, so they don't know what that feels like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Be being a hunter, I have, and uh, it's not pleasant. But it but it looks like they're prepared to beard the teacher unions and say, well, here's the numbers, this is the proof. Show me why this is wrong. Yeah. Uh, and and until you until you can convince me that I've misread these numbers somehow. We're not listening to you. Yeah. Well, you've also got to take into account. So it's difficult. Uh, it, their aim is by, I think, 2030 to have 80% of kids at standard. Now, that does raise some questions for me because we all know who the other 20 are. And so, look, they're probably the ones that that even Obama would say, these are the ones that we need to lift. Um, so I think we need to be a bit more ambitious than that. We're, we're also in that situation 
uh, where we talk about being at standard, there has to be some incentives there for kids to excel mm. as well. Um, so I know it's a it's a it's a soundbite, uh, but there has to be a little bit more detail behind that um, to say exactly how we get there and what that means and how many kids have we actually got absolutely flying on. If, and- if we get to a point where the standard has. 95% of pe- people meeting that standard. Isn't yeah. it to raise that standard? Uh, yeah, it's a, yeah. obviously you, 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 you want to keep improving. Um, and our, our foundational teaching uh, is, is so important in, in so many areas. Uh, you, you're scientists to be taught really thoroughly you know how to how to use the periodic table, and and as you would say, the history of it. How amazing these discoveries have been, but also true science that we still don't know everything about it by any stretch of the imagination. They change when we learn something more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and that's exciting. Uh, I mean, I I say to any family. Uh, you know, one of the most important books you, you can have in your house is Bill Bryson's Short History of Nearly Everything. Now, it's a great read. Uh, he inspires you to look into science. But even that, I think it's probably about 10 to 15 years since its release. Yeah. Uh, there's been several updates, you know, because the stuff that was known 10 or 15 years ago is significantly different in many areas. And so, you know, that's why the stupidity of that saying the science is settled. The science is not settled on anything. Just about to raise that because when they, when they, and I was going to say that's part of the, the systemic problem there is in teaching, right? Yes. There would be probably 95% of teachers agree with that, that the science is settled on climate change. Yeah, or so, anything. So, yeah. so what they teach at their school is not actually science. What they're teaching now is that this is accepted yeah. And you therefore anything that you uh, have to say against this yeah. is spurious. I mean, I had a problem with that with my daughter. You know, she she was asked to write a paragraph, I think, in year two or something on climate change. And <laughs> in my daughter, she wrote climate change is a fraud and, and yeah. a few other things. And I got called up by the teacher to discuss the issue, the problem of my child. Right. And I said, Well, what what's the problem? Well, this, she's wrong. I said, No. Is she? Do you know that? <laughs> is it, yeah. And then there's, 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 there's a whole paragraph. range. Yeah. yeah. Did you write a paragraph? Did it have an opening sentence? Did it have yeah. a closing sentence? Did it have some stuff in the middle that supported the beginning and the end? Yeah. Yes. Well, did she write a paragraph? Yes. Well, why haven't you given her 100%? Because she's wrong. Yeah. No, you have to write a paragraph about a topic. It doesn't matter whether she was right or wrong about that topic. You didn't, there wasn't yeah. a topic it was about teaching them to write paragraphs yeah i look i, I love working with kids who who uh, you know we're supposed to be doubters uh skeptics uh in, in life we're supposed to challenge everything mm. uh, and you know most movies are about that aren't they they're about that person who flipping challenges everything but we hate it in the real world we and um i, I mean I, I i was teaching a class once and um, really cool year seven kids. And uh, I, if I'm doing the basics of science, I, I, I try and teach it as thoroughly as I can. So it doesn't get have to be untaught later. So you know, I taught them that uh, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere. Mm. And then we talked about the variation. So when you, when you go to Rotorua, they tell you that some of the water is 200 degrees Celsius a bit down. And, you know, the kids go, well, how the heck is that possible? It's um, still liquid. Yeah, because it's it's deep down, you know. And uh, a poor teacher's college student came in and said, well, we all know that, you know, water boils at 100 degrees. And he had 12 hands uh, go up in there with such rapidity that the arms nearly came out of their sockets. And the poor guy, he didn't know, you know, that it was at one atmosphere mm. uh, and all of these variations. And, you know, to me that, that was a little sad because he he got through, I, th- I think, NCA science um, without knowing a foundational truth that's incredibly important. And, and, I mean, back to these sort of these submissions. So that's where I, I think the unions have really lacked integrity 
because you know they say, well, this 153 million that's going to charter schools, uh, if that was spent in the state system, and you're like, hang on a sec, it's 0 0.07 of one percent of uh, vote education. Mm. It is comparatively a tiny amount, and they keep saying, but we could get 700. Uh, teacher aids funded through this. Yes, that's 0 0.03 of a teacher aid per school in New Zealand. If it's solving a problem, find your $153 million somewhere else uh, if that's, you know, if that's the fix. And I just think lack of integrity from these uh, people who would like to be known as professionals is a really big deal for our community, let alone striking, uh, teacher-only days, all of these things that impact on kids that they just don't care about. Political activism, you know, where they get all the kids to make signs and march down the streets for whatever cause the teachers are into. Yes. <laughs> all right. but we could talk for, for hours about this, Alwyn, yep. uh, but, I, but I, I just wanted to, to give listeners an idea about we have a problem in our education system. We do. The problem rests as much with parents as it does with those who are in the education system. Mm -hmm. Parenting's a big problem. Yep. But the education system has got a, a systemic problem there, and we actually need to look at addressing that. And when you nut it down to it, it ain't the kid's fault. I think that's a that's that's a really, really big deal. Um you you slowly build children uh, into taking responsibility. And if they don't, then obviously there's a fault that lies there. I mean, I often talk about school should be a 300% model. You know, you need to convince parents that their child's education 100% depends on them. Have you got them organised? Uh, are you interested? Are you engaged with the school? Because all of those things we know make a big difference. Yeah. You've got to convince your teachers that it depends 100% on them. Yep. Uh, they have to be good. They have to know their subject. They have to be very caring, which matters to kids. Yep. And 100% depends on you. And then over time, uh, it, it, the kids have got to come up. But when you've got a five or six, a seven-year-old, you know, probably a 13 or 14-year-old, the child isn't going to bring 100% uh, every day. The adults in their lives have to do that. And, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's so important. It's so foundational to our society. And if people want to look at it from a financial perspective, as, you know, Cameron Bagri often says, uh, our productivity depends on a good education system. Um, every kid that fails, again, if you want to look at it this way, uh, costs our country hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, uh, in, in a range of ways, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that seems a very good note to finish this interview up on, that striving for excellence uh, is probably the way out of this. If only we could get everybody to agree that winning is a good proposition. Well, I just think if, if you want a winning situation, I, I think uh, Christopher Luxon and Erica Stanford have made a start. You know, they 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 stood up. Uh, there was a political aspect to it, but ultimately they were saying something that's really important. Yeah. Um, and, and and now they've got to push on with it. Um, but I think you're right too. I mean, it would be a, a stunning. Uh, but the teacher union should stand up and say, "Look, there's there's a big heap of truth in this, and we are going to spend the next." three, five, six years improving that teacher profession uh, and have this kind of driven. But, you know, you you touched on it, and I kind of have it as well, but I mean, explicitly, if you teach a kid to win, mm -hmm. right, it doesn't matter whether it's sport or a chosen subject, yeah. if they're used to winning, they want more winning. Well, the neat thing about academics too is, you know, clearly the Olympics are on as we talk. And, and it's a it's a one or three winner, depending how you look at it, contest. Yeah. Um, well, academics isn't like that. Every kid in your class can, be a winner. Can, can go on to achieve something remarkable. 
that maybe you haven't thought of, their parents haven't thought of, um, but but you can elevate them into a situation where they think of it and they get stuck in. And that's what is rewarding about being a teacher. I've never worked a day in my life because it's just the most amazing industry, I suppose, what do you call it, uh, sector to be involved in. Yeah, and, and, and if we teach kids to seek success and, and enjoy success, you look at sales reps, you know, commission only sales reps, they get their enjoyment from winning, from getting that sale, from getting that commission yep. week in, week out. Uh, if they're not getting commission, they start get, getting grumpy. If they're not getting the sales, they start getting grumpy. But who's who's responsible? That's for the, it's the individual. Yeah. But you can be trained into doing certain things that will ensure that you are a winner in your chosen field, whether that's academic or sports or anything else. That people who rise to the top are the ones who are prepared to build that habit of winning. Yeah. And and that's how they do it. But everybody can win at at their own level. But but, but not being able to do maths uh, in year eight, that's that's not a winning uh, recipe for. No, and if you don't, if you don't, if there's no change brought to that situation for that child, a large part of their options are shut down, and and that that's the human tragedy with it. And it, it is a big deal. And I'm glad we've made a start. Well, and we've got to have these discussions as well so that everybody can actually speak up and say, no, no, we want to develop this attitude within our schools and yeah. have agency, at least have agency on behalf of your own children. Yeah. Um, and, well, and, and, and I, um, I mean, these, the, a lot of these organisations uh, get to sit around a table in Wellington. They call themselves the peak bodies uh, in education. There has to be a parents group. Um, built into that now. I think that is that is absolutely crucial. Someone who can sit at the table because School Trustees Association don't do it. Someone who can sit at the table and say, from a parent's perspective, this is what we're seeing. And uh, I think that's crucial. And on that note, Alan Paul, thank you for coming on The Crunch and talking education with us. My pleasure. Alwyn is so calm and patient, and it shows you the kind of teacher and educator he is. Such wise words on what the issues are and how to fix them. Clearly, we need to do something because what we have been doing in education hasn't worked and has actually made things worse. Tell me what you think. Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.